Thank you so much. Yeah, it's um, the world reimagined. And I thought, well, I've been doing that all my time in uh, Indonesia. I've been uh, trying to change the things, but in the way nature does it. So let me tell you a little bit about what I've seen so far. I think we have basically five very big problems. We are changing the climate. We are uh, causing huge disturbances in all the balances in the world. We are not using our agricultural resources, our natural resources in a sustainable way. Our manufacturing systems do not look at all what nature looks like with perfect recycling, zero waste principles. The way the diversity, the difference between the rich and the poor people in the world is growing all the time and how our environment is suffering as a result of the urbanization. And also how we are organizing our information because all this information is stuck in all these different disciplines. And indeed, as was just mentioned, I like to see the bigger picture and how we can bring those things together. So learning is a very important part we need to learn from nature. I learned a lot from the school children, how they see nature, working with them in Indonesia. And I learned a lot from the higher primates. I work with orangutans, but also with gorillas and chimpanzees and gibbons. And they need more than just uh, a little bit of intelligence. We also need culture to be passed on between generations. And we need to create a secure and loving environment, otherwise, we wouldn't be a human. What's a human baby without the love of its mother, without culture, without education? Not a human, cannot survive. And we need to process information to survive. We need to learn. And for an orangutan, maybe it's uh, unexpected, but it's quite complicated life for this orangutan in the trees here. And try to imagine yourself huh, in the situation of an orangutan. We wouldn't get very far if we didn't have that specific know-how. Maybe we should also think not just about the orangutans, but also about how other people close to those forests in the third world countries are living. Hmm? You have to make all these decisions like an orangutan. Eh? Will it go take me in the right decision? Eh? Am I not going to encounter some snakes? And uh, hopefully that isn't a branch which is going to peel off my skin because it's very poisonous, etc. So, Let's look at the climate issues and what I've seen myself in the field. Let me take you to Indonesia, to the rainforest, where I've spent the last 30 years of my life. I have learned an awful lot and still not enough, because the great thing is every day you go into that forest, you learn more. But that forest is disappearing quickly. This may look like a serene picture, but actually this is like a silent volcano, because right here, which is happening on millions and millions of hectares as we speak here. These big hills of peat that have been growing for 10,000s of years, accumulating all that carbon from the atmosphere, are being destroyed for biofuel, to run cars in an environmental way. Well, at the same time, these emissions are doing much more damage than we actually reap benefit from this. Every year when you plant oil palms on these peat domes, they will decompose 12 centimeters. That's 220 tons of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere every year. And also with the oil palms, you create very few jobs. You create a lot of environmental problems, pollution. They use chemicals that will last for centuries. You only create 0.12 jobs per hectare. The natural rainforest provides 0.15 jobs per hectare. People lose their traditional land rights. There are no more medicinal plants left. And when the orangutans, which have lost their forest, are eating some of the leaves of those oil palms, they get killed and people put a bounty on their head to get rid of those nasty pests. Well, they also have a right to be there. And it's a suffering not just of humans, it's the suffering of both orangutans and humans. This mother carrying her dead baby around, no more food. People are burning and people have really no idea of the scale of what uh, is happening now. In Indonesia, we are now, unfortunately, I'm an Indonesian national, the third largest emitter in the world. And 80% of those emissions originate from environmental destruction. 
This is in 1998. For three months, the automatic lights during the day did not go off because there was simply not enough sunlight to penetrate those clouds. You were coughing, you were feeling weak. Orangutans were sitting still in the trees. And if you look what happened in that period, there is this biggest increase ever in carbon dioxide. And it is related to a single big fire event in the jungle of Borneo, where these oil palms have opened up the peat swamp forest. Compare now what happened there. In uh, Germany, people have spent billions of the euros just to get a 0.05 gigatons of CO2 savings. Over here, there was a damage of 200 billion dollars because of one such an event. Seems that it might actually be worthwhile to save those orangutans, let them keep their house, and it may be good for ourselves. If you look at the scale where that smoke and all that pollution went all around the world, it is almost unimaginable. We read about it in the newspapers and in the journals, but it's like just a movie passing by and you forget about it very quickly. Well, if you look at the world from space, where the lights are on during the night, you can see that the world is getting a pretty crowded place. And I don't think people here are going to be willing to switch off the lights. So we're going to find a way to power our Earth and do it in a way that is truly sustainable. So we need to go to sunshine. We are not using our natural resources in the right way. Our agriculture is totally different from the way nature does it. Nature provides lots of different products, makes good use of the rooting zone, of the space above the soil, and these monocultures are a total difference with the forest on the right. But that forest on the right is not a forest, it's a garden. Every part in that garden is a useful component. And if you compare that with the way you guys are doing agriculture here in the United States, I think there is some reimagining to be done. Yes, you have had the Dust Bowl, you've had all those problems in the past. So we really should be looking at nature, imitating it, creating a biodiverse forest, which is much more efficient at storing these greenhouse gases and is much less susceptible to pests and diseases, regulates the climate and can provide more jobs and income and can secure the biodiversity, because that is our only future capital, the biodiversity in those jungles. Let me talk about a sweet solution. I say sweet solution, for me it's double sweet, because I had to pay my dowry in the form of six sugar palms to marry an Indonesian tribal queen. And I thought, hmm, how is that possible? Well, it turns out six of those palms are enough to keep a young family alive. So that put me on the trail. How can we use this huge productivity of this palm for the benefit of more people? So how can you tap it? Because you can tap the juice from this flower. You don't need to harvest anything else. You can directly tap sugary juice and the energy equals about 82 barrels of oil per hectare per year. So this tree is like one of the most uh, efficient Photo, biophotovoltaic cells we can think of in the world. And we can do restoration of these lands. We have about a billion hectares of critical lands around the world that we could restore using systems which have grown here on this grassland which had no value before. Here is an area with sugar palms. In three years time you can really change the surface and create a forest that truly supports people. If you look at the differences between where to do things, here or in the tropics, it's clear that in the tropics you can grow the crops year-round, you have a higher photosynthetic rate, and the temperature is better for the kind of photosynthesis which is more efficient, that is the C4. And if you must compare between agriculture and forest, it's also very clear that forests can use the light better. And that's where we need to go. We need to go to a society where we only use as much energy as we can capture from the light. That includes wind and uh, uh, water, hydro energy. These corn and these sugarcane lands use a lot of fertilizer and they are not uh, being put to use for uh, food production anymore because the energy is needed. So if we look at this green belt around the world, that is where we should be doing our activities, where we have the highest solar radiation. 
And why sugar palms? The sugar palms, they produce more. They don't need to invest in their structure. Let me show you a little bit scientific stuff. If you plant corn, it has to grow up. It has to invest only in its own structure. And only in the last few weeks, you will get some material that is stored in these corn cobs. And then you can make some ethanol out of it. In the tropics, you can use more of the time. But look, this is what sugar palms can do. They can make all year round use of that light which is coming in and they're all there ready to catch that light. And this is how it looks like. You see, they're growing on the steepest slopes. So you don't take away from the agricultural land and the food production and even can survive a year underwater. So if you have that Irrawaddy Delta or the Bangladesh flooding, have these palms, you have four kinds of food from the palm, the fruit, the starch, the palmite, and the sweetmeat, and they even survive fire. And here is a tree hit by lightning and still produced a year-long juice. This is a volcano in my village, and you can see that all the trees near the volcano have died, except for the sugar palms which survive very well. Still, they're not an invasive species, and they grow extremely well on these steep slopes because they have roots that go deep. They don't go to the side. They get their nutrients from a place where other plants don't pick them up. So they become like fertilizer pumps for the whole forest. And the roots are so strong eh, that you can, from a three millimeter root, can hang 50 kilograms. Those rocks do not slide anymore, so you can bring the slopes in the production, and at the same time, you uh, stimulate the agriculture downstream. The petalms can be tapped. I'm running out of time, so I have to go faster. And we looked at where can we plant these palms. So we did a physical suitability mapping. We looked where is the temperature enough, where is there enough rainfall, etc. And then we put those five things together in one map, and this is where you can grow them. Now, that's not enough. You also need to know if there is infrastructure there, if there are enough people, is the income level good enough? So this is where we can actually grow them, in this belt around the equator, which is huge, huge area. And uh, if you compare what the world needs in terms of oil, 6.3 billion barrels in about 30 years, we could replace all of that with only 540 million hectares. So here's a scalable solution. Let's look at our manufacturing systems. We are using the world in a wrong way. We have here a village hub, which is a little factory, which is a zero waste system, which is a miniature of that factory I just showed you. And this factory here uses geothermal energy, but the little ones are using part of the energy in the sugar to process the rest of the sugar. So you don't need any more fuel wood. And that's the biggest problem I had to face in order to develop the sugar palms, because the people would clear cut the forest in order to get uh, enough uh, timber to boil the juice. So it would lead to environmental destruction. This one uses geothermal energy, and I don't have enough time to go in detail. People are using the earth wrong, Easter Island. Many of you undoubtedly know the story, what happened there, overpopulation, overshoot, and in the end, they were left with this devastated area where nothing could live. This is another island, less well known. This is Ascension Island in the Atlantic Ocean, and there the same happened when in 1831, Darwin stopped there with a beagle on the way back from his travels to South America. There was not a single tree on the island, but then the army decided to plant some trees because they needed water. So now this mountain is named Green Mountain, and look, with the forest, the clouds are back, the water is back, and people can live there again. So if we continue with the urbanization and the overpopulation, and in this total unnatural way, then we are not going to last very long. This is a much better way with the sugar palms, which provide year-round job opportunities, better job opportunities than normally. The Village Hub is a little factory that provides a lot of products that the local people need. The sugar is fermented, the ethanol is distilled, the ethanol runs a generator, the generator gives the people electricity, the rest of the fuel goes to the women so they don't need to collect the timber, the yeast can be made into cattle feed, you can then, and I have all these benefits, and still you have a stream of sugar that can become a source of income and carbon credits. Now let's look at the data systems. We know an awful lot actually about our planet. We know 
exactly at what month what forest is changing in what part of the world. But somehow all these different informations are not being utilized in a good way. Why is that? And it's so important to look at these things. Look at this blue area here. That is what we call the canal to hell because in this area there is actually a giant peat dome, a hill of peat, and people made a cut in it. And the water now flushes out. And what that does to a peat dome is just incredible. Let's look at these satellite images. You don't see a lot of changes until the beginning of 1997 when President Suharto decided to make a one million hectare rice field project to provide food enough for the people in Indonesia. But look what happened after they dug that canal, the peat dome started drying out on the top. And 35 days later, there's 10,000 hectares of trees dying already. And another two months later, all of that forest on 15,000 hectares, a size bigger than Washington DC, had died. And a little bit later, there was nothing left but a poisonous lake with no fish, no meat, no trees, nothing left. Totally gone because of one canal. Actually, there's another peat dome that collapsed as well. So if you look at this, where there used to be a hill, we now have a huge hole. And all that carbon dioxide that was in there is now into the air. An amount, in just a few months' time, of the omission of a country like Sweden. It's just incredible what is happening. So we make a tool, a tool to connect all these different bits of information. And it started with a biodiversity tool. And this is not just a biodiversity tool, it can connect all these different silos of information about the species, about the biotopes, and we can connect information in a quantitative way to the qualities of the species itself. I'm going to show you how these are now all interrelated and how we can make use of such a tool to actually get real-time information. Let me forget about this part. Let's look at the children. Suppose you are here in uh, Camden and you want to look up a plant that you found in your garden, like this one here. So the computer can now know, ah, you're online in the East Coast, so you can draw a line. So you can limit the amount of species that match those trees that you are taking the flowers of with the area. Let's click on the flower. We just click on the characteristics. So what do you see? The flower is white. OK, click on white. What is happening? The number of species in the background gets smaller and smaller. It's now 14. And you can continue this process. And you come up with a name. You realize what this is? If 10 children will find the same new species of butterfly, you have just proven a one degree temperature shift. You have now a real-time climate change detection program. So you can involve the community through these kinds of software in this process. Now the last thing, how can we make the science work? If we make, sorry, this one back. This leaf is very simple, just a representation of the real leaf. We make this tree out of it. We can make it nicer and nicer. This is not a drawing, this is not a picture. This is actually how real trees are growing according to genetic algorithms that stimulate, uh, that uh, regulate the architectural model. These leaves on the trees are not just leaves. Look at this picture. You can see exactly how, many, how much carbon is in each leaf, in each twig, in each stem, in the roots of this tree. How much light does it intercept? You can take this further to a plantation or to a mixed forest. So you can now start formulating recipes that you can use to do reforestation anywhere with the real trees. What science can do when you connect the dots. You see the sun going over, so you can now use the real climate data to actually calculate what the impact is going to be of your actions upon the biomass. I have no time to talk more. I'm already over my time. But we can make recipes for any situation in the world. And we can drape those on maps and instantly generate business plans, work plans. And we can quantify what the effect of each individual upon the world is. And this is really what we should be doing to make our planet a better place. Not just for us humans, but for every fellow primate. 
I'm now well, I'm in, a, in a process how to get this information to the world. So I set up with Aubrey the Tapper G. We're trying to scale up now in a second round, the only proven technology that we have to bring the sugar palms to the world. And if you're interested, you can have a look. And I hope that one day we all will be able to make a good use of the information technology, as Paula said, told us in the beginning. Thank you.